What up guys, it's your boy here, Lord Lucas. Shout out to my main man, Vinay, for giving me the inspiration to speak like this to you. That'll be the last time that happens. Uh, but in all seriousness, welcome to our first video on the Year 12 syllabus. Today we're going to be starting Module 7, which is all about organic chemistry. And what I want to do for this video is just start to talk us through some of the key ideas that underpin organic chemistry before we start to get a little bit more stuck into the dot points uh, in the syllabus. So first of all, we need to be thinking about what is organic chemistry? Organic chemistry, put very simply, is the best of all the chemistries, in my opinion. I may be a little bit biased, but nonetheless, organic chemistry is so important because it's the study of every single chemical that we come across in our lives, with only a few exceptions. Uh, the vast majority of chemicals that we come across in our lives are actually organic. And what organic means is simply containing carbon. So if you look at these pictures that I've put in front of you, you can see drugs, plastics, petrol, oils, people. Uh, there's thousands of other things I could have easily put on this list instead of these. But the, the bottom line is, is that pretty much every single thing we come across is an organic molecule. And the reason for this is because carbon-based molecules are able to be far more complex than just about any other type of molecule that we're ever going to come across. And the reason for that is quite simple. If we look at carbon, we can see a very simple diagram here, and you know by now that this diagram is actually far too simple, but it does serve our purpose of illustrating this point very well. Carbon has six electrons, and the electrons are really what makes chemistry possible, but in particular, it is the valence electrons. So whilst carbon has six, we have two guys here in the first shell, although we know that they're actually in a thing called a 1s orbital, but we'll leave that alone. We have four valence electrons on the outside. We've got one guy here, number two down here, three, four, four valence electrons. And it's the valence electrons that are responsible for chemical bonding, particularly in non-metals. Now what we can do is we can look at this in action. If I have a carbon atom, I'm representing my four valence electrons as dots, like a simple Lewis diagram. One carbon can be hanging around by itself with its four electrons, and then maybe one day another carbon comes along. And this other carbon says, Hey guy, I noticed that you have a spare electron, and I have a spare electron as well. Why don't we get our electrons and combine them together to make a bond? And carbon says, Alright, that sounds good. And then maybe another carbon comes along. And he says, Hey guys, I noticed that you guys have got this whole bonding thing going on. Mind if I join in? And the second carbon says, yeah, sure, I've got another spare electron here, how about we share? And so, fair, sure enough, they do. And then maybe another carbon comes along and says, hey. And then the third carbon says, yeah, sure, you can bond as well. Now, this can go on, as you can see, for really any amount of time that we like. But the other thing that, of course, can happen is that other elements can come along. The most common element in the universe is hydrogen. And so hydrogen is quite often the one that gets into the party. So maybe a hydrogen comes along and says, hey guys, mind if I... Yep, sure. And eventually you can see that any available bond that is not made up of carbon is most likely going to be a hydrogen to carbon bond. And so we end up with these molecules that are largely carbon-based. Uh, hydrogen can often be the, one, the element that gets involved in any other opportunity. And we call these things hydrocarbons. <laughs> He's named after what he is. Now, we'll spend some more time in future videos talking more about hydrocarbons in terms of the different types of hydrocarbons and how we name them and their chemical properties. But for the time being, all I want to focus on to finish off this video is the different ways that we can represent hydrocarbons. So what we have here on the screen right now is a molecule called propane. You'll notice that this molecule has one to three carbons and each carbon is then made up all of the rest of the bonds with hydrogens. Now there are lots of different ways that I can represent a molecule like this. The first is the type of representation that I have on screen right now and that is called a structural formula. You can see on this formula that each covalent bond is represented by a line and every atom in the molecule is represented uh, diagrammatically so we can see all of the carbons represented by a letter C hydrogens by the letter H, and we're pretty used to seeing these kinds of diagrams already. 
Another way we can represent a molecule like propane is representing each carbon as a ball. So you can see these dark shaded balls here are the carbon atoms, and then smaller white balls represent the hydrogens, and they are joined together by stick-like projections, and so we call that a ball and stick model. These ball and stick models can be helpful for envisaging what these molecules look like in a little bit more detail, uh, and they have their time and place for being useful. Another way that we can represent organic molecules is with something like this. Now this might look like something out of Big Hero 6, but all this really is is a space filling model. And what we're showing here is the outside of the electron clouds as best as we can uh, based on which atom those electrons are coming off. So the outside of all the hydrogens here is shown as white clouds and the outside of the electrons coming off the carbons we can see as these gray clouds and because they are sharing electrons those clouds overlap. This type of diagram gives a very good idea of how much space a molecule actually takes up compared to where the bonds are but it's not very useful for showing the bonds themselves. The last type of formula and the one that we're actually going to spend the most time on, despite how boring it looks, is called a skeletal formula. Now, believe it or not, this formula here is actually representing the exact same molecule as all of the others. And I want to show you how this works. On a skeletal formula, every end of a line or corner where two lines meet is actually representing a carbon atom. So there is a carbon here, a carbon here, and a carbon here. As you might expect from previous diagrams, the lines between the carbon atoms are representing covalent bonds. What is not shown on this diagram is all of the other hydrogens that are actually joined to these carbons. So on our first carbon here, we would actually have three more hydrogens. On this second carbon here, we have two more hydrogens. And on this last carbon here, we have three hydrogens. So this is the exact same molecule that we looked at just before, only now we're showing far less detail. And the reason why this is useful is because even though this doesn't look like much, once you realise that every single end of a line is a carbon and every single spot where there is nothing shown is matched up with hydrogen, it becomes a very simple and powerful way to represent complicated molecules with very little actual drawing. So let's have a go at drawing one of these things. What I have up on the screen right now is a molecule called pentanol and we'll get more into the details of why it's named pentanol and uh, how we can figure out that it's named pentanol and all of those kinds of things down the track. But just for now, you'll notice that this molecule has one, two, three, four, five carbons. It has mostly carbon to hydrogen bonds taking up all of the rest of the available space with the exception of this group over here, an OH group. It's important to remember when we draw our diagrams that carbon will always be making four bonds total, but a lot of the time when we're drawing skeletal diagrams, those bonds will not show up. So the first bond that we want to represent on our skeletal diagram is this one right here. So we're going to represent that as just an upwards line. The next bond that we need to show is this one here. And because we can't have another straight line without it losing exactly where one line starts and where one line ends, we'll move that one diagonally down. Now we draw our third bond, fourth, and there we have it. So this here is the beginnings of our skeletal diagram of this molecule pentanol. But you'll notice there is one key point of difference. Whilst we're in the habit of ignoring hydrogens, on this side over here we have something different going on. We have oxygen. And we actually do need to represent that. So what we're going to do is draw one more line and we're going to have that going out to an OH over here. So where we have our oxygen, we draw it and we're not bothering to draw this bond here because it's a bit superfluous. We can just represent that as OH joined together. And this becomes our structure of our pentanol molecule. Now you'll notice, if we go back over our rules again, each carbon is either at the end of the line or at a point where two lines meet. And you would think based on that rule that maybe there would be another carbon here, but that's not how it works. If you have a line going from a carbon to something interesting like an oxygen or a nitrogen or a chlorine, that is actually going to be its own separate bond. And you will know that there's no carbon there because whatever is there will be labelled. 
So in this case, it's an OH. So the molecule that we have up in front of us is simply a bunch of up and down lines so that we have five carbons in total and then one extra line pointing out to show us that there, there is an oxygen OH group joined onto the end. And that is a structural formula. Now just as we finish up, I want to spend a bit of time showing you this website called molview.org. This is a website that allows you to represent and draw organic molecules quite quickly and in a way that's quite intuitive. So I'm going to go into full structural mode quite early just to show you how this works quickly. I'll clear off what I've got so far. Down on the left hand side here you'll see there's a carbon chain tool. If I click and drag this I can add one carbon, two, three, four, five. I can make a chain however long I like. And I'm basically here making a hydrocarbon chain. What you'll see now is I have a structural formula, and just to prove to you that this is indeed a structural formula, I can now model this thing in 3D. So if I click this 2D to 3D button, over on the right hand side here, in just a moment, there will be a representation of this molecule. Because I picked a big molecule, it's taking a bit longer to render than it would otherwise. But any moment now, the structure will appear on the right hand side, and here it is. So this is a ball and stick model of the molecule that I've just drawn. You'll notice, uh, just to prove that I'm not lying to you about how carbon chains work, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 carbons in this molecule on my structural formula, and I can count them off on my ball and stick. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And there are different types of models I can look at here, I can look at stick models where the different sections of stick are representing atoms, that's quite a confusing one so I don't necessarily recommend that you look at that one for too long. Uh, we have our space filling model otherwise known as van der Waals spheres and you can see the way that this molecule actually takes up space. Uh, and wireframe which shows each little atom as just a tiny little stick but it, uh, that can be of use in some situations or we can represent the molecules, uh, each bond as a line and each atom as a line as well. Obviously the most helpful I would say is the stick, sorry not stick, ball and stick. This shows each individual atom and then represents the bonds between them. So we can draw all kinds of organic molecules if I get rid of what I've got on the left hand side here. I could draw maybe a carbon to carbon bond, maybe add another carbon, another carbon, I can then render that and you'll see that this is propane. Or I can add more complicated structures, maybe I could add a chain that actually bends back around onto itself and so look at what this molecule looks like. And every type of organic molecule that we could want to draw is going to be uh, able to be represented using these kinds of diagrams. So look at a very common molecule that you're likely to come across in your lives as you grow into adulthood. We can look at a molecule called ethanol. Now this drawing here is very, very sloppy, but you will see what the actual molecule looks like once it renders. There we go, ethanol. So C2, two carbons, we've got five hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, and we've got one oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, that's OH. So C2H5OH, that is ethanol, that is the main component of alcoholic drinks. Every single type of organic molecule can be represented in this way. Although obviously the more complicated the molecule, the more complicated the representation. But this website here, moleview.org, is a very, very useful website just to start to think about putting in some of these structures using the tools you see on the bar on the left hand side here in order to be able to then render these into 3D images and get a sense of what they actually look like. Uh, it will help you a lot to, to play around with this tool just to see what do these things look like and how good is my understanding compared to what these things look like in the real world. 
So just to recap the key ideas in today's video, we are starting HSC Module 7, which is all about organic chemistry, and organic chemistry is the study of carbon-based molecules. The reason why organic chemistry is so important is because carbon can make four covalent bonds, and that means that it is able to make very long chain molecules if carbon bonds to carbon, which can then further bond to more carbons and then bond to other things like nitrogen or chlorine or oxygen or whatever the case may be. So four covalent bonds per atom makes carbon a very versatile atom for making molecules. Uh, now the simplest type of organic molecules, the ones that we've spent most of today's video looking at, contain only carbon and hydrogen, and so we call these things hydrocarbons. And we can represent organic molecules in lots of different ways, the main ones being structural formula, ball and stick, space filling, and the most important for quick communication being skeletal. And if we look at skeletal formula, there are certain rules that we need to remember. The first thing that we need to remember is that every carbon-carbon bond is represented as a line. So if I was to draw it as one line like this, that would be two carbons, carbon here, carbon here. Uh, carbons can be assumed to be at the end of a line, or if there is a corner between two lines, we would have something like this, and that would be a carbon here and a carbon here. So unless otherwise labelled, you can assume at the end of a line or a corner between two lines, those are carbon atoms. All carbon-hydrogen bonds are assumed and not drawn, and each carbon will make four bonds total. So if we look at this carbon here, this carbon is currently only making two bonds, which means two other bonds will have to be hydrogens. On these diagrams, every other type of atom will be individually labelled. So if I have a chlorine, let's say I have a molecule that has a carbon chain involving four carbons, but the second carbon has a chlorine attached, I will draw on that chlorine as being part of the diagram. It's very important that we recognise that anything other than carbon or hydrogen will be labelled. And the final thing is, if I was to have, say, four carbons and then the last carbon is bonded to a nitrogen and that nitrogen is bonded to say two hydrogens I don't actually need to draw it like this with these two NH bonds represented as lines it is quicker and easier just to call this thing an NH2 group and so I will draw that as just NH2 so these are the rules for skeletal formula and it's very important to have a good understanding of these the best way to get a good understanding is to play around on a website like Moleview, look at different molecules, look at how that translates across to a ball and stick formula, draw some things, see if you think that it's going to look the way that you think it does, check to see if you're right, and play around some more. So that brings us to the end of our first video. I hope you found this helpful, and hopefully there will be many more videos like it in the future. I will see you in class.